A number of years ago, Peter was a young man. He was walking through the fields of Scotland. He had stayed at a friend's house for many, many hours and played with that friend all day. Peter was in his teens, 15, 16 years old. It was dark at night, the sun had set, and he was walking through the, fe the heather fields in Scotland. He couldn't see anything, it was inky black in front of him. And as he was taking a step, he heard a voice, and that voice said, Peter, Peter. He fell to his knees, put his hands before him. He felt as if God had tapped him on the shoulders. As he reached out, there was nothing before him. His eyes gradually adapt to the darkness, and he looked straight down a hundred feet down a sheer cliff. He had walked off the path. Another step, he would have stepped over the cliff and plunged to his death. There on all fours, he thanked God for saving his life. And later in his life, when Peter Marshall became the chaplain for the United States Senate, after immigrating to America, he called that experience God's tap on my shoulder. God's tap on my shoulder. As we go out through life, there are times that God taps us on the shoulder. There are times that God stops us in our tracks. God moves in very powerful, very unusual ways. And tonight we're going to read the story in Daniel chapter 4. And if you have your Bible, I'm inviting you to turn there to Daniel chapter 4. We're to read the story of God tapping a heathen king on his shoulder. In Daniel chapter 4, we have the only chapter in the book of Daniel that is not written by Daniel. The entire book of Daniel is written by Daniel. But Daniel chapter 4 is not written by Daniel. Daniel chapter 4 is written by King Nebuchadnezzar. This is the only chapter in the Bible written by a heathen king. And it's as if Nebuchadnezzar says, wait, Daniel, I need to tell my story. Wait, Daniel, I have something to say. Wait, Daniel, I want to give you my testimony. Daniel chapter 4 is one of the most amazing chapters in all the Bible because it's the story of a heathen king who was converted to Christ. It is a very unlikely conversion. You would not expect Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king, to want to give a testimony. We read in Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. Do you have your Bible there? We can read it as well from the screen. Let's read it together. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Now this is a very strange thing. Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, that attacked in 605 B.C. Jerusalem and overthrew it, that attacked again in 596 B.C. and destroyed the city, that burned the city to the ground. Nebuchadnezzar was one of the most warlike, one of the most bloodthirsty, one of the most ruthless rulers. But yet he says, peace be multiplied unto you. It, only, it almost sounds like the Apostle Paul when he starts the epistles of Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians, when Paul says, Grace and mercy be and peace be multiplied unto you. What is it that changed Nebuchadnezzar? What is it that took him from a man of war to a man of peace? What is it that took him from an angry, bitter, resentful man that was bloodthirsty to one who had his life totally changed? Nebuchadnezzar says to you and to me, to all generations in the future, this heathen king, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Nebuchadnezzar says, I thought it was good to tell you my story. He's saying, I want to speak to you. And 2,500 years later, the book of Daniel is still speaking to us. 2,500 years later, the words of a heathen king speak to this generation. And they speak with meaning and purpose and direction. Now, if God can transform a heathen king, there's hope for us. If God can reach down and touch the life of somebody like Nebuchadnezzar, if he can touch the life of a heathen king, if he can change that man. You know, I've had people come to my meetings and they've said to me, Pastor Mark, is there any hope for me? 
You really don't know my background. You don't know my past. You don't know what I've been involved in. About two weeks ago, I was speaking in Lisbon, Portugal. Immediately after the meeting, a young woman, a teenager, came up. She wasn't dressed, obviously, for a religious meeting. She was dressed as if she were going to a nightclub or a dance. And she came up, took my arm, and said to me, Pastor Mark, I've had no interest in religion at all. No interest in, in the things of God. I, I, I've been out drinking and using drugs and a variety of other things. But I came here today, somebody invited me. As you spoke, something touched my heart. As you spoke, there was a stirring in my soul. As you spoke, I sensed that Christ was real. Can you tell me more about Jesus? If God can touch a heathen king, I don't know what your background is. I don't know what your past two years of your life were, or three years, or five years, or ten years. I don't know what your thinking is. You may have come from a Christian background and be a solidly committed Christian. Or you may have just come in tonight and you may look over your past and say, I wish things in my life could be different. Here's the incredible good news for you and me. Wherever we are on the journey of faith, God takes us right there. The only place to begin is where you are because there's no other place to begin. And God takes us where we are. And if God can do amazing things in the life of a heathen king, he can do some amazing things in our lives as well. King Nebuchadnezzar says, how great are his signs. Listen to his testimony. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. It's like Nebuchadnezzar is saying, kingdoms rise and fall. Kingdoms come on the scene and go off the scene. Kings rise and fall, but the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ reigns forever. And it's as if Nebuchadnezzar comes to the knowledge, he comes to the awareness that the kingdom of God will last forever, that it will triumph. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, in flourishing in my palace. Now here's the amazing thing. When the sun rose that morning, Nebuchadnezzar had no idea that that day his whole life would be changed. It's amazing how life goes on. And one day we wake up in the morning and our whole life is changed. Life can change in an instant. You're at home at night waiting for your wife to come home from work and there's a phone call from the police that she's been in an accident and she's a paraplegic for the rest of her life. Life can change in an instant. You go to work one day, and your boss tells you that the company is not done well, and you're laid off, and you can't pay the mortgage, can't pay the car payment. Life changes in an instant. You go to one doctor's appointment, to your dermatologist, you think it's, you think it's a, very, uh, a very ordinary appointment, and he says, you know, that mole is, uh, looks a little strange to me, the contours on the, mold are, on the mole are uh, not even, not symmetrical. The mole is not um, a, uh, a pretty color. The mole is changing colors. You know, I need a biopsy. It. He biopsies it. It comes back and it's malignant. You know, your life can change in an instant. Nebuchadnezzar thought everything was going well in his life. His life was flourishing. But in an instant, Nebuchadnezzar's life changed. And in that change, in that crisis of life, he was drawn to God. And there are times that life goes well, but there are times that we have reverses in life. And in those times, at times God uses the reverses to draw us closer and still closer to him. And so Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts on my head and the visions of my head troubled me. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. We read about the dream in Daniel chapter 2. We saw the great image in Daniel chapter 3. Therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Wait a minute, King Nebuchadnezzar. Hold it here. Didn't you quiz those guys before? Nebuchadnezzar, let's get with it here. They let you down in chapter 2. They're certainly going to let you down in chapter 4. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar says, then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, remember who they were? The magicians were the ones that would take calves' livers and they would cut the liver of a calf and look at the design and try to figure out the future. The astrologers would try to see patterns in the stars. The Chaldeans were the educated elite. They were the PhDs of the country. The soothsayers were those that were, we would call them necromancers. They try to communicate with the dead. And he says, I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me the interpretation. What's the difference between what happened in chapter 2 and what happens in chapter 4? What's the difference? Yeah, in chapter 2, I have good students here. In chapter 2, he did not tell them the dream. He said, tell me the dream and tell me its interpretation. Now he cuts them a little slack this time. He said, all right, guys, you know, you guys failed in chapter two. I don't want to embarrass you anymore. All right, guys, I'm going to cut you a little slack here. I'll tell you the dream. You tell me what it means. So he tells them the dream, and they still can't tell him the interpretation. Then the Bible says in Daniel chapter 4, verse 8. Do you see it in the scripture there? Daniel chapter 4, we're looking there at verse 8. Look in your Bible, please, or on the screen. He says, but at the last, Daniel came before me. At the last, Daniel came. How foolish we are sometimes. We try all of our human solutions to solve our problems. And we come to the end of our rope. We say, all right, God, now please help me. All right, God, please help me. I've tried on my own. I've tried to solve this thing. At the last, Daniel came in before him. Wouldn't it have been much wiser for him to call Daniel in at the first rather than at the last? And isn't it much wiser for us when we face the challenges of our lives not to get all bent out of shape, not to be all feel all anxious and nervous and tense, but to say, God, I know you can solve this problem. God, I know you can solve it. God, I'm putting this problem in your hands. The Bible says these were the visions of my head. So this is Nebuchadnezzar telling his story. While on my bed I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was very great. We're looking in the 10th verse. He's telling us what he saw in the vision. If you have a Bible and you want to look on, there should be pulpit Bibles that you can pull out. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. And its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. So he said, I saw this tree, and the tree kept growing and growing and growing. And the tree was so incredibly large that its height reached to the heavens, its branches to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in the branches, and all the flesh was fed from it. Now, do you picture this dream in your mind? I want you to visualize it. The king goes to sleep one night, and he has a dream. And in that dream, he sees a tree that is small at first, but it begins to grow. The tree grows so large that its arms spread over the earth, and the tree is so high that it's high to the heavens. The birds of the air fly from every direction, north, south, and east, and west, and they are in the branches of the tree. The animals from around the, throughout the fields come, and throughout the earth, and they eat from that tree. The tree is this incredibly large tree. It seems to nurture the whole earth. Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, this is what I saw. I saw in visions of my head while on my bed. Then he said there was a watcher, a holy one, that's an angel, coming down from heaven. What does he do? He cried aloud and said, thus chop down the tree, cut off its branches. Now by now, Nebuchadnezzar is a little nervous. He sees this tree. He doesn't understand what it means. He sees an angel come down from heaven with a mighty sharp axe, and he chops down the tree. Then the Bible says, nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze. So the tree is cut down, but there's a stump left. And there's a band around that stump. And what does the band consist of? What does the band consist of? Iron and bronze. Nebuchadnezzar goes on. There's a voice. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast. Let seven times pass over him. 
this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the holy ones. Next verse. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. So here's the vision. There's a tree. Grows large. Has much fruit. The beasts of the field eat of the tree. A holy angel comes down, chops down the tree. There's a stump left with a band of iron and brass. The purpose of the dream is to reveal to all the world that the most high rules in the kingdom of man. Now, if you saw that dream and you had just described the dream and you were Nebuchadnezzar to Daniel, what would you expect from Daniel next? What would you want? You'd want what? The interpretation of the dream. Now, there are those people that say Bible prophecy is so confusing with its mystic symbols that nobody can understand it. But look, if God gives the dream, don't you think God wants us to understand what he said? So, here we go. Let's look at the interpretation of it. Now, remember the chapters we've studied before. We're looking at each chapter in Daniel and saying, what does this say about God and how can I apply it by my, to my life today? In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel was taken into captivity, and at the end of that chapter, he passes his comprehensive exams for the University of Egypt, and he becomes one of the ambassadors for the king of, the king of Babylon. He passes his comprehensive exams, he becomes one of the ambassadors, one of the princes of Babylon, one of the prime ministers and rulers. In Daniel 1, God turns defeat into victory. In Daniel 2, God reveals the future. He reveals the dream. In Daniel 1, we say, whatever defeat I experience in my life, whatever heartache or sorrow, God can turn that defeat into victory. In Daniel 2, we say, we have a God that knows the future. I may not know my future, but God knows the future, and I can trust him. In Daniel chapter 3, God is the redeemer of his people. The, the fiery furnace burns. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown in. But God leaps into the flames, and there's God in the flames. Whatever flames of life you and I go through, God's there to protect us. He's there to guide us and direct us. But in Daniel chapter 4, God is the ruler of kings. God has every nation in his hands. And I would think that on November 7, a night before a political election in America that has been so contentious, so conflictual, uh, a night when America stands with bated breath wondering what is going to happen tomorrow, a night when many people are extremely concerned about the future, I think it's good to remind ourselves that who's ever elected, this world is still in the hands of God that whatever direction thrown in some way, God is going to work in the, counter, in the play and counterplay of human history to accomplish his prophetic purposes, and this world is in the hands of God. And I think that's good news, isn't it? I think that's incredibly good news, that he is still the ruler yet. So Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, Daniel, this is the dream, I saw the tree. What does it mean? Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time. Now, if you missed the first chapter, why does it say then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar? Not Belshazzar, but Belteshazzar. When Daniel, the name Daniel means God is my judge, God is my vindicator, God's the one who's going to set all things right. When, as a Hebrew, he was taken captive into Babylon, his name was changed to Belteshazzar, and Belteshazzar means the keeper of the hid treasures of Bel. In other words, the one, Bel, was the chief god of Babylon. So they changed his name from a Hebrew name to a, a Babylonian name. He was astonished for a time. His thoughts troubled him. So the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. Now this is rather fascinating, Daniel's reaction. Here's why. Do you think Daniel said, King, praise God, hallelujah, that tree is you, and you're going to be cut down, and you're going to go wander around and eat grass for seven years. You're going to get yours, Nebuchadnezzar. You attacked 
Jerusalem, you took my people into captivity. I've been waiting for this moment now when you'd lose your kingdom, you'd lose your mind, you'd go out there and eat grass like an oxen, and I can't tell you how happy I am. Would you have said that to your enemy? <laughs> have you, now you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but you, have you ever been delighted when somebody has done you in and then it came back to them. You said, what goes around comes around. <laughs> Have you ever been delighted when those who hurt you are hurt? Have you ever been delighted when somebody did you dirty? That they slipped on a banana peel and broke their leg? You don't win your enemies by wanting bad to happen to them. Daniel had a heart for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel did not take joy that Nebuchadnezzar was going to lose his kingdom. Daniel was a captive in a foreign land, but he loved this man, Nebuchadnezzar. And you can never see somebody one to God unless you love them like God loves them. Daniel had every reason to be bitter, to be angry, he was taken at 17 and a captive in Babylon. He would never see his father again, never see his mother again, never see his brothers and sisters again. But yet, he learned to love the one that took him captive. And that love broke Nebuchadnezzar's heart and made him open for the things of eternity. So, so Daniel was concerned that he did not want to say much but Daniel could never influence the king unless he loved him. You can never influence the one who has treated you unkindly and unfairly unless you first love them. And when you love them, you can, that love can break their heart. God never treats us as we deserve. He treats us as he knows we would want to be treated because his very nature is love. And the reason why we forgive others who've harmed us is because Christ has forgiven us. The reason we treat others with love is because Christ treats us with love. And so God never treats us like we deserve. Ned Daniel now speaks. He says, the tree you saw which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth. It is you, O king, you've become grown and become strong. He said, king, the tree is you. You are this tree. I'm king. I have to go further. Insomuch as the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump in roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. King. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High which has come upon the king. The Lord, my king. King, you are that tree. Your kingdom is going to collapse. You're, you're, you're going to lose your throne, king. They'll drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. You're going to make grass and eat grass like oxen. They'll wet you with the dew of heaven seven times. In the Bible, a time is like a year. Seven years will pass over you. Many translations say seven years. Till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. King, this is going to, what's going to happen? Your kingdom is going to collapse. It's going to fall over. And for seven years, you're going to wander around like a wild beast eating grass. Your hair is going to grow long. Your nails are going to grow long. You're going to grunt and groan like the beasts out in the field. The king is absolutely amazed. He's absolutely astounded. They'll drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with beasts of the field. They'll make you eat grass like oxen. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. Daniel says, look, king, this doesn't happen to have to happen to you. King, this does not have to happen to you. King, if you will listen to the dream that I've given you, God is tapping you on the shoulder. 
you can have a whole change in your life. There are times that God taps us on the shoulder. We are going in a wrong direction, and God nudges us, and God speaks to us. He brings conviction to our heart. He brings somebody into our life to lead us on a path of righteousness. He's tapping us on the shoulder. But there are times that if in our stubbornness we resist those taps, God allows calamity to come upon us to show us the futility of our own human wisdom or strength to draw us closer to him. What God did in the life of Nebuchadnezzar is remarkable. God tapped him on the shoulder. But God gave him 12 additional months. One of the amazing passages in scripture you'll find is in Daniel chapter 4. And you look at it there in Daniel chapter 4 and let your eyes drop down to Daniel 4 and notice what happens here. Chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. It said, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. Somebody asked me once, are the seven times of Daniel 4 prophetic time? Can we apply them to some long time prophecy in the future, etc., etc.? It's very clear in the Bible. This is the historical section of Daniel, not the prophetic section. And the Bible is very plain. Verse 29, it's verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. No secondary application. It all comes upon Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 28. Notice verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. What does that tell you? When Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream, the fulfillment of the dream did not come immediately. How much time did God give Nebuchadnezzar? 12 months. He gave him 12 months to think about it. He gave him 12 months to repent. Isn't God gracious? Isn't God amazing? He gives them a dream of judgment. But when he gets that dream of judgment, he does not inflict the judgment immediately. God is going to convict our hearts. He speaks to us. He does not let his judgments come upon us immediately. He does not let his judgments come upon us instantly. He gives us time, and he longs for us to repent so that those judgments do not come. That's true with nations, too. God has been speaking to America. The judgments of God hang over America, and God's been speaking to it. To come back to him in repentance. Come back to him. But God gives every king time. God gives every nation time. But as we'll see in Daniel chapter 5, there's a time that the mercy of God runs out. We'll look at that a little later this evening. God gave Nebuchadnezzar time to change. He gives us time. He speaks to our hearts. He convicts us with his Holy Spirit. He draws us to himself. Daniel 4 verse 30, the king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built? Notice the arrogance, the pride for a royal dwelling of my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. The king blurts out in pride, this is Babylon that I have built. And the Bible says, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice from heaven said, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it's spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. They shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Verse 32, they'll make you eat grass like oxen. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar, who was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagles in feathers and his nails like bird claws. Wait a minute, I see somebody out in the field. Who is that out in the field? Who is that with the long hair? Who is that crawling on all fours? Who is that, that stinky, smelly animal, that, man that looks like an animal? Who is that with the long nails? Who is that? He's the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon? He was the most educated, the most cultured man in all the world. He knew science, he knew math, he knew literature, he knew language. He commanded armies. He could snap his fingers and the orchestra would play and they'd bring him all kinds of food. Who is that? He's Nebuchadnezzar. Out in the field like that? Now it's very fascinating if you do a medical analysis of Daniel chapter 4. Many physicians have taken a look at Daniel 4 and they've looked at the symptoms. And there's a medical dictionary called Dorland's Medical Dictionary. 
and it lists as a disease lycanthropic insanity. Lycanthropic insanity is an interesting disease. It's a disease that occurs instantly, and it does not seem to have any symptoms coming on, and when you develop lycanthropic insanity, you perceive yourself to be an animal, and you feel more comfortable with animals than you do with human beings. And there's, it's very rare disease. It comes on very suddenly, and uh, those physicians who have analyzed Daniel chapter 4 have said that the symptoms in Daniel 4 are the symptoms of lycanthropic insanity. Evidently, God withdrew all of his protective power from Nebuchadnezzar. And God allowed him to develop an instant disease called lycanthropic insanity that God gave to him to show him the folly of trusting human wisdom. And so he wanders around among the beasts. Who do you think ruled the empire for seven years? Who do you think did that? Daniel. You remember when the tree was chopped down, what was left? A stump, and what was around that stump? A band of what? Iron and brass. Now, in the Bible, iron always represents power or authority. Remember Psalm chapter 2. When the Messiah comes, he'll rule with a rod of what? Iron. What does the rod of iron symbolize? The authority of Christ. Authority is always the um, iron. Remember the Roman Empire. It's power or authority described in the legs of iron. What about bronze or brass in the Bible? What does that represent? It always represents protection. You remember, for example, uh, the bronze, the thighs of bronze on the image of Daniel 2. The metal or the shields, the armor of the Greeks were bronze. Remember the brass or bronze serpent on the pole. You look to that serpent and you live when Moses put it up there. It was protection. Bronze or brass is protection or salvation. So what does the band of iron and brass represent? It represents God's divine authority and protection, his saving power yet for Nebuchadnezzar. When the tree is chopped down, when the situation looks hopeless, there's a band of iron and brass. The divine power and authority of God still protects the divine salvation of God still reaches out when the tree of my life is chopped down and things in my life appear to be hopeless. The stump still remains. The roots still go deep. And the band of iron and brass is still there. And God's divine authority, his power is still there. His saving grace is still there. He still reaches out to those that wander around like the beast. To Nebuchadnezzar's story really is the story of the human race. God created Adam and Eve as king and queen of this earth, as prince and princess of this earth. They had dominion. They sat on a royal throne with a royal robe. But Eve drifted away from God and Adam drifted away from God. And they sinned, they rebelled against God. Rather than listening to his word, they listened to the word of the evil one. They lost their dignity. They lost their respect. They opened a door that God wanted forever shut. They lost their royal robes of glory. They no longer sat on a throne. They wandered around in their lostness. But then they looked to heaven and sensed that the Messiah would come. Nebuchadnezzar's story is their story, and it's your story and my story. Every single one of us were created for royalty. Every single one of us were created for the throne. But through our own rebellion, we wandered around in our lostness. We lost our robes of righteousness through sin. We lost that glory through sin. But we look to heaven. Here's one of the greatest verses in all the Bible. Verse 34. You're looking there at verse 34. Daniel chapter 4. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. 
he lifted his eyes to heaven. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. You know, you look back at that. Nebuchadnezzar looks to heaven. His whole life is changed. Once again, his throne is restored. Once again, he's robed in royal robes. Once again, he has his kingly crown. So you and I, too, wander around in lostness. We've sinned, we've rebelled against God. We've lost those beautiful robes of righteousness, but we look to heaven. We look to heaven. Wherever you are tonight, here's the incredible good news. You and I looking to heaven can be daily robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Looking to heaven, we can sense that we are not lost children anymore. Looking to heaven, we're sons and daughters of God. I love the way the Bible puts it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Would you read it with me, please? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Christ, we are new creations. In Christ, we don't wander around in lost nests any longer. In Jesus, we are redeemed. The human race was created perfect, but through sin, our natures were changed. But God can reach down and change us. John 6, verse 37 says... The one who comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Nebuchadnezzar came to him. Daniel chapter 4 says, he looked unto heaven. He came to him. And Jesus' arms were wide open for Nebuchadnezzar. And they're wide open for you and wide open for me. Isn't that incredible good news? Whoever we are, whatever our past history, whatever the story of our past life, there is a Jesus who says, look unto heaven. If he could save Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, there's hope for me, isn't there? And there's hope for you. Hey, everybody, Matt Gray here, media director for Hopeless 365. Don't go yet. Make sure that you subscribe and click the bell so you get notified of the next video in this series. And I think you should check out these other videos over there. I think you'll like those as well. See ya.